The moral arc is about how, uh, one, things are much better than they've ever been, than we realize that they've ever been, and two, the cause is not what most people think. Most people think moral progress is the result of religion and religious forces, but in fact I show that's not the case. It's science and reason. Ever since the Enlightenment, we've been working to apply the methods of science to improve human life on all aspects, including morality. Um, the book title was inspired by Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous line from his How Long speech, which is that uh, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And uh, he got that inspired by a 19th century abolitionist preacher named Theodore Parker, uh, who said that the, there's an arc to the moral universe, and, and, uh, and he could see that it was bending in the right direction. And this was before the Civil War, so even then people could see that there was some progress. And since then we've really documented it. And what I'm trying to do in the Moral Arc is show using data sets and science and analytical reasoning to show that things really are getting better, that we've been doing something right, and we can actually identify what it is uh, using the methods of science. And one of the things we've been doing right is applying science to solving human problems. The first is that um, things are bad and getting worse. I mean, everybody thinks that. You can't help but think that when you watch the evening news. It seems like this is one bad news after another. But in fact, the long-term trends, if you follow the numbers instead of the news, you see that things are getting better in all aspects of life. And that the second misconception is that it's religious forces that have been the drivers of this. People always hear, oh, religion ended slavery and so on. In fact, that's not the case. Most of the moral progress we've all experienced today is the result of secular forces of science and reason applied to solving human problems. You know, of course, there'll always be some violence, but I, I don't foresee any more major power wars, no more World War II type events. I don't think that's going to happen again. Uh, there'll be little skirmishes, of course, because that's part of human nature is to fight over things. And of course, there'll always be homicides. People are jealous or angry or, you know, they get in fights. But, but, the, but the numbers of those are, are, will go down so much that the chances of you and I dying violently will be close to zero. Uh, and, then, and then prosperity. I, I see, uh, even in Africa, the, the end of poverty by about 2030 to 2050, it'll be completely gone. No one will be living like they are now. And that there'll be so much prosperity, life will just be so much better for so many people, that will reduce a lot of conflict. So I'm fairly optimistic about the future. Sure, slavery is a classic example. Everybody thinks that it was religion that abolished it, but in fact, that's not what happened. People cite, for example, William Wilberforce, who was a deeply religious man who was campaigning for the abolition of slavery in England, but who was he campaigning against were all his fellow Christians and believers who justified slavery through biblical passages and theological arguments and so on. What ultimately won the day to abolish slavery was the idea of universal human rights that all people should be treated equally. And that idea does not come from the Bible. You will not find that in any holy book. That comes from enlightenment principles that rights are natural and they belong to every human being born. I've always been interested in uh, the idea of progress and that uh, that we can go from here to there into a better world. I mean, it's almost like a science fiction fantasy, but in fact, when you use science instead of just science fiction, you find out, hey, there are actual trends. We can, we can get there, even though there's no utopia to get to. Life can get better applying the methods of science and technology and reason. And uh, so the personal interest in me is I'm just a science guy. I love science. I think science is cool. I think science is the best tool we have for understanding the world, understanding how the world works, not just in physics and biology, but in human psychology and, and, and in politics and economics and beliefs and how we can live together more peacefully. And it's science that'll tell us, well, what are the best conditions to set up. What, what works better, democracy or theocracy or autocracy? Well, science can answer that question. Moral progress is probably the most important thing we face today because it seems like we could drive ourselves into extinction. It seems like we, we, you know, it's one damn thing after another and, and we never learn anything in history. But in fact, that's not the case. The fact that things have been getting better and that we've been doing something right it's science that'll tell us exactly what it is we've been doing right and wrong and do more of the right and less of the wrong 
to continue to expand the moral sphere, to include everybody. I mean, if you just look back just a short period of time, I mean, it was only a few decades ago that, uh, you know, that Jews were banned from colleges and, and country clubs, that blacks were lynched. Uh, I mean, it was not even a century ago that women couldn't vote, even in America, the land of the free and all that. Um, I mean, people forget that, you know, conservatives today are really more liberal than liberals were in the 1950s. And it's happened just gradually enough that you don't notice it until all of a sudden you're there. And then somebody like a historian or a scientist like me comes along and goes, look at the long term trends. Oh, wow. Things really are better. You know, in King's autobiography, he identifies people like Gandhi as his heroes. And in the theologians, he says, influenced him were these more secular liberal type theologians. And uh, his arguments, in any case, are not based in biblical uh, arguments because there, there are no biblical arguments for why we should expand human rights to include everybody. If you went by holy books, you wouldn't expand human rights to very many people at all. It, so it really comes from uh, secular arguments that really took off in the 18th and 19th century for why people should be treated equally, not as a means to an end, but an end of themselves. That's Immanuel Kant and, and David Hume and Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Paine and John Adams. All these guys were, they were not religious people. They were making secular arguments. Uh, I guess the biggest surprise was to what extent science and reason do make a difference. I thought I might be wrong in some of the instances like what really brought about the abolishment of slavery and the importance of government to pass laws to change people's behavior. But what I realized is that underlying it all are these just better arguments and better evidence for why the government should do this or you should do that or the law should read like that. That it's what's behind it is our ability to use our minds to think and reason through solutions to problems. And that's encouraging because it means there is hope for the future. And it also means that you could do it, I could do it, we can all contribute to this. It doesn't depend on experts or whatever. We can all get in there and figure out and, and make a little contribution to make the world just a little bit better place. Well, first of all, it's all, all of us are individuals uh, with a moral sense about uh, what's right and what's wrong. And so in each of my chapters, you know, the sort of the take home messages is that all of us make a difference. It, it comes down to you doing something and me doing something and all of us working to make the world just a little bit better. Uh, and if we do that, that's what kind of pushes the arc along. It, it bends it towards justice when we all try to do something a little bit, just a little tiny bit. Um, and, and it's the individual more than anything else that counts in our moral thinking because um, it's the individual person or organism or being that can suffer. You know, not, it, I mean, racism is bad, but it, it isn't races that need the right to vote. It, it's the individual that needs to vote. It, it isn't races that suffer from homicide. It's a person that actually suffers physically. So ultimately the argument comes down to people need to be treated as individuals. In any case, the worst things that's ever happened in human history have happened when collectives argue that it's good to sacrifice the few for the many. Uh, and, and those few, are, are, of course, usually don't get a vote in that. And they're never the leaders and they're never the ones that think this is a good idea. It's always somebody else. So that kind of argument is what gets us in trouble. So uh, I guess that, you know, I have uh, 88 figures and graphs in the moral arc. I, I guess the three, the three best ones, there's the rise of democracy, it just phew, spirals right up there. And related to it, of course, are the, the spread of, of voting and the franchise for more people. Be because that empowers regular people to have political power and political control and say over their lives. I guess the second one would be uh, the, the dramatic decline of violent deaths through homicides and war, uh, because that makes me feel like the chances of me dying personally, or you, my friends and family, people I love and care about, are, are much lower than they would have been. I mean, in the Middle Ages, almost everybody knew somebody who died violently. I mean, today it's it's very rare, and that's encouraging. And then the third one is the uh, prosperity. The number of people that have um, are living in poverty has collapsed compared. It was 80% in the 1800s of the world was li living in poverty, and now it's it's about 20%, one in five. It'll be zero by about 2050. And then on the the flip side of that is how, the prosperity, the increase in prosperity. Just just having just having enough money to eat and a roof over your head and education and 
that kind of thing. Most people never had, and now most people do have in the West, and, and soon everywhere in the world. Because the human mind is not designed to see long-term trends like that. The human mind is designed to see Im immediate, uh, emotionally salient, uh, meaningful events, which is what the news presents. Um, and so this is why people have a hard time accepting evolution and climate change. I don't, what do you mean the earth is getting warmer? It was cold yesterday. You know, we remember yesterday's weather, not the thousand year trend since the little ice age and this has happened. I want to know what happens tomorrow. <laughs> so that's what the brain cares about. And most people think, you know, oh, I saw something about racism or, or there was a war in the Middle East. Oh my God, things are terrible. So it really takes a scientist and a historian to look at those long-term trends. And, and we will always be rare in that sense. Uh, but, 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 but we got to get the word out there. We're doing something right, guys. Let's, let's do more of that. What could be more interesting? What more entertaining? I mean, these these spectacular long-term trends and huge events, world wars and revolutions and riots and these things, they're changing. Wow. I mean, everybody should know about this. <laughs> I mean, this is good news. It's not just good news. It's huge. It's big news. And also, this is part of what's called big history. There's a new trend called big history, you know, from the Big Bang to last week. Let's look at the whole big picture. And let's break down all those, those academic barriers, you know, the history department's over here and the science people are over there and the economists are over here and the humanists are up there. No, this is, we're all in this together to, to solve these problems. And we should look at it from the big picture and bring all the sciences together to, to answer one question. Are things getting better or are they not? And they are.